Well, thank you for a very successful first day of our conference. I've been hearing progress reports from everyone, a lot of networking going on, because that's as important um, as the events itself, that you get to know each other, develop new alliances, and work toward a common goal of media reform. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to introduce um, our next speakers, um, and we have another very exciting day ahead of us. I'm first going to introduce the introducer. Uh, for those of you from Hong Kong, we need no introduction to Justice Michael Hartman. He will be introducing us to Lord Dyson. But from those of you from overseas, please indulge me for a moment so I can tell you a little bit about him and why he's perfect for introducing our keynote speaker. Justice Hartman is now serving on the Court of Final Appeal as a non-permanent judge which caps more than two decades on the bench in Hong Kong. Born in Bombay, raised in Zimbabwe, then known as Rhodesia, he received his LLB from the University of London. He had to leave Zimbabwe because of his vigorous defense of a defendant that left him facing his own charges of contempt of court. He came to Hong Kong as an attorney and was appointed to the high court just after the handover in 1998 which turned out to be a very good turn of events for Hong Kong, because Justice Hartman went on to rule on some of the most important constitutional and landmark cases. Uh, just a couple, little bit of a flavor, he set aside search warrants uh, issued by the anti-corruption agency here in Hong Kong to raid seven newsrooms, yay, press freedom. He found that the unequal ages of consent between heterosexuals and homosexuals unconstitutional against the Basic Law and the Bill of Rights. He declared that the procedures in, in 2006 for covert surveillance and wiretapping were unconstitutional. Let me just read you, and I'm sorry uh, to do this to you, um, uh, Justice Hartman. Um, he had his uh, farewell sitting from the Court of Appeal last year in which they said the following. He had a deep and abiding sense of fairness and his landmark judgments delivered in his trademark, succinct, direct, but easily understood style that has left an indelible mark on the jurisprudence landscape of the Hong Kong SAR. As we spoke yesterday about the importance of the judiciary and rule of law, um, having judges like Justice Hartman, and there are others as well on the bench, is very key to continued success. But on a personal note, I'd like to thank Justice Hartman for his role in helping to educate a generation of young journalists at the Journalism and Media Studies Center. Um, many of you might not know this, but for the past 12 years, he's been opening up his courtroom to the students uh, to spend time with them and talk about the rule of law, but more significantly, the importance of a strong press and how they can help keep an open system of justice, which is a perfect segue to our next speaker. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the, the introduction is going to be longer than my speech, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I'm here just to say a few words uh, in order to introduce you to uh, Lord Dyson, John Dyson. Uh, John Dyson was called to the bar, the Middle Temple, in 1968. He was made a QC, a, a Queen's Council, in 1980 and in 1993 was made a judge of the High Court of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It is said that, or it is said of High Court judges in England and Wales, that they are a product of empire. They are greatly admired by their peers, but never envied. This is because they are first bestowed a knighthood, and then they are worked to death. <laughs> it says something for the system, however, that very few of them, if any, wilt under its burdens. Almost all serve with great distinction, and none more so, I may say, than Lord Dyson. Lord Dyson was appointed to the Supreme Court in 2010 and now graces the office of the Master of the Rolls. For the uninitiated, 
It is a somewhat bewildering title. Uh, it tends perhaps to conjure up images of a head librarian laboring in the great library of Alexandria. Of course, what it suggests in its antique language is not what it is. The master of the roles is the head of civil justice. The master of the roles is the second most senior judicial position in England and Wales after the Lord Chief Justice. I speak purposefully of arcane terminology because terminology shapes perceptions and perceptions shape reality. If I may for a moment latch on to a local example, at the moment our High Court lacks its full complement of judges. The shortfall is largely made up of retired judges who are frog-marched back to service and judges who are appointed up from the lower courts. And they are all called deputy judges. Those who administer our courts think nothing of this. But if you speak to any practicing barrister, they'll tell you of a standard complaint from litigants, which is two years of pleadings, $100,000 in fees, and they give me a deputy. Why can't I have a proper judge? And we may laugh at it, but the litigants don't, and I think it's a fair point. I started life, as Doreen has said, as a reporter. And uh, in reporter school, we were taken to court. I recall we spent most of a day there. Uh, there were about eight of us, and none of us understood a word. I recall it being entirely eccentric. It was an appeal, and the judge in the middle kept calling counsel for the appellant by the wrong surname and being corrected. I learned later that the misnamed counsel was the judge's son-in-law. <laughs> All of this uh, is accompanied by a sort of shabby mustiness together with the melodies of arcane language, much of it seemingly from my O-level Latin, doggerel Latin itself. It could not last, of course. A social institution as important to the cohesion of any open and democratic society as the judicial system is unable to cloister itself in such a way permanently. Light had to be let in, and that meant changing the architecture. The renovations have taken a long time, and they continue to this day. But they are critically important, and to a greater or lesser degree, they are endeavors being undertaken in most common law jurisdictions. Without that much needed light, the law will lose its respect. And once it has lost its respect, it has essentially lost its integrity. In Hong Kong, this is, I think, especially important at the moment. For various reasons, which I needn't touch upon, there appears to have been an impasse at the level of politics in Hong Kong, which has sadly, and I can say this as a retired judge now, led to perhaps more active internecine struggles than would otherwise be the case. It means and has meant that a very large focus has been placed upon our judiciary so much so that our Chief Justice has on more than one occasion commented upon the fact that perhaps the public places too much of a burden upon the law. 
whether that burden is placed upon the law or not, the law has up until now risen to the challenge. But it too, that is in Hong Kong, must continue with the work of renovation to ensure that we have true transparency in our system. Lord Dyson's address, and I hope I do it no disservice, will speak of the labor of letting more light shine upon the workings of the common law system, especially in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. From that point of view, I know that Hong Kong, as it has done in the past and will do in the future, has a great deal to learn. His address will be entitled, Sharpening the Public Gaze, Advances in Open Justice in England and Wales. Thank you very much, Lord Dyson. Good morning, everybody. Um, oh, to be a retired judge, I thought, <laughs> listening to that. Uh, because uh, I have certain inhibitions uh, which uh, Justice Hartman no longer uh, has to um, operate under. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in Hong Kong after more than 20 years uh, and to have been asked to give an address to such a, a distinguished and lively audience. I thought that uh, yesterday's proceedings were terrific, um, very impressive indeed. When I was a barrister, I came here several times, always to do construction cases. That was in the pre-1997 era, and I always enjoyed those visits. This, is, this was then, and obviously still is today, such an exciting place. Uh, I imagine that most of the buildings that I saw then have been replaced as having been out of date. In fact, I know that the hotel that I stayed at no longer exists. Uh, nothing stands still here. There is no clinging to the past, no nostalgia for days gone by. Change is the name of the game, whether it's physical change to the environment or economic or constitutional change. But even in the UK, that most traditional of countries, changes have been taking place at, some may think, rather an alarming pace. Some of these have been forced on us by the economic crisis that has afflicted the world in recent years. Others have occurred as a response to the re remarkable technological developments of our time. Uh, and uh, some of these technological developments are relevant to what I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, uh, as you know, my subject today is open justice and the recent developments that have been introduced and are being considered in England and Wales, and I should emphasize uh, that I held no brief whatsoever for Northern Ireland, and, and indeed if there were any Northern Ir Irish person here, they would have been utterly horrified to hear what was just said. Um, Problem with being a colonial judge. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I, can I say uh, what I'm not going to talk about? I'm not going to talk about uh, fascinating questions such as uh, anonymity uh, of um, uh, witnesses in courts. I'm not going to talk about um, special procedures that have been introduced, special advocates and the like, to deal with sensitive security uh, cases and that sort of thing. Um, there's an awful lot going on in our jurisprudence and I know in jurisprudence elsewhere to deal with those difficult legal questions. Uh, and many might find that sort of topic more interesting than what I am going to talk about. So this is what was described to me earlier on when I made that point clear. Uh, as managing expectations, uh, so I, I thought I'd get that out of the way at the outset. But open justice is a principle that has long been a central feature of our justice system. When civil trials were conducted before a jury drawn, drawn from a local community, justice was done under the eyes of ordinary citizens, and of course they performed a central role in the whole process. Uh, ordinary citizens also had free access to the courts if they wished to see what was going on inside them. As a general rule, uh, in our country, the days of the civil jury trial are now gone, and when the Defamation Act uh, comes into force, as you know, the presumption will be that civil jury trials will be confined to proceedings for civil fraud, malicious prosecution, and false imprisonment. 
The days when the general public would attend civil trials in large numbers uh, are long gone. Television may secure high ratings for legal and courtroom dramas, but an interest in compelling fiction does not translate into increased attendance uh, to witness real proceedings. This may have something to do with a general impatience these days and an unwillingness to sit through long and often rather dull hearings with no guarantee of excitement and in the hope that there might be some nugget at some point in the day. Uh, what comes to my mind is the, that uh, the falling attendances at county cricket matches in England and Wales may be another example of this. The decline in public attendance at court, as well as the decline in media reporting of civil proceedings in general, poses a problem. This problem was identified um, by Jeremy Bentham in the 19th century. And Professor Andrews of Cambridge University uh, succinctly described the problem uh, nearly 20 years ago when he said, justice administered behind closed doors will soon reek to high heaven. This is the procedure of a despotic legal system, not an open and liberal one. Bentham supplied the theory. He insisted that justice should take place publicly in order that the judges be kept up to scratch. And what, he, what Bentham said was, publicity is the very soul of justice. It is the keenest spur to exertion and the surest of all guards against improbity. It keeps the judge himself while trying under trial. Professor Andrew's solution to the problem was to suggest that the principle of publicity ought to be emblazoned on a banner displayed aloft the courts, royal courts of justice. Uh, well, very uh, nice ways of putting uh, what is, I'm sure we'll, we'll all agree, is a hugely important point, the need for open justice. Uh, a, a banner such as suggested by Professor Andrews would have the virtue of making it plain to everyone passing by the courts that they know the courts uh, are there, which people often don't, and that they're open to the public. Well, that suggestion was made 20 years ago. It was a suggestion when, from an era when the internet was in its infancy. Mobile phones were a long way uh, from being smart, and social media platforms like Twitter were unknown. So I want to describe uh, and make a few comments about uh, some of the steps that we have taken and are considering taking in the light of 20 years of uh, advances in communication technology. Uh, so uh, 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 to, to raise a metaphorical banner over our courts, a banner which will give practical reality to what Lord Brown recently described in the Al Rawi case, which many of you may know about, uh, as the highest of constitutional principles, open justice. So I'm going to focus on uh, televising courts, the use of social media, and what we have in our system, the Judicial Communications Officer and Judicial Media Panel, uh, which are ways that we have uh, brought about to, to try to uh, enhance um, people's understanding of, of uh, what judges are doing and uh, uh, explaining their judgments to the extent that it is appropriate, as we think, to do so. So to start with televising courts, it is nearly 100 years now since photography in courts was banned by the Criminal Justice Act of 1925. The first UK television broadcast was not made until 1929, with ad the advent of national television, the ban was extended to cover filming as well as photography. The reason why photography was banned was that there was a growing concern that newspaper coverage of trials, and in particular criminal trials, was becoming increasing, increasingly sensationalist. The issue first came to a head, as far as I know, in 1912, following the murder trial of Frederick Seddon. After he had been convicted, photographs were taken of him in court while he was being sentenced to death. The question arose whether the photographs were taken with the permission of the relevant authorities. It seemed that no permission had been sought or granted. Questions were then raised in Parliament, and the Prime Minister was asked to consider whether legislation should be brought in to render the publication of such photographs unlawful. The rationale behind the uh, ban in 1925 to stop, I'm sorry, the, the, the rationalization behind the ban was to stop sensationalism in reporting. 
photographs of defendants being sentenced to death did little to inform the public of uh, what had occurred in the court. Uh, that could not be communicated fairly and accurately in writing. They did, however, excite a degree of prurience, perhaps resembling a little that exhibited by those who in earlier times used to go to Tyburn to witness hangings. At all events, the ban stood in England and Wales from 1925 until the creation of the Supreme Court. Uh, and the, the ban didn't apply to that court for the simple reason that, by definition, it is not a court of England and Wales. The Supreme Court was therefore able to come to an arrangement with Sky Television to provide live coverage on its news channel of appeal hearings and the delivery of its judgments. It is now possible for the public and aspiring barristers to watch some of the best advocates in the country argue before its highest court from the comfort of their homes, their smartphones, or their laptops. I understand that approximately 22,000 people do so each month. As someone who sat in that court as a judge for, for more than two years, I, I can honestly say uh, that I, I did not find the television cameras, which were very unobtrusive, they were just a, a tiny little black hole, as it seemed, in the corner uh, of the, uh, the room. Uh, I didn't find their presence uh, at all disconcerting. In fact, I rarely even thought about, uh, about their presence. And I have to say that my indifference to their, their, them was not always because I was dazzled by the brilliance of the legal argument that I was hearing. <laughs> Nor did I ever have any sense that the behavior of any of my colleagues or the advocates was in any way influenced by an awareness that they were being televised. I believe that the president of the Supreme Court, Lord Newberger, commented that he'd been told um, off by his wife and daughter for slouching on camera and having a, an apparently smug smile. Well, I can't comment on that, of course, other than to say that if he was guilty of that, it's good proof that the presence of the camera was not causing any change in behavior on the part of the judges. <laughs> Following the introduction of live televised broadcasts of proceedings in the Supreme Court, it was understandable that the question would be asked, why limit them to the Supreme Court? The ensuing discussions led to a government consultation paper in May last year, which proposed introducing filming of both civil and criminal courts in the Court of Appeal, and at some future date, sentencing remarks in the Crown Court. Filming would not extend to the High Court. The government said that it was, and I quote, aware of concerns that televising our courts may open the judicial process to sensationalism and trivialize serious processes to a, a level of media entertainment. These court concerns were, of course, as applicable to the Crown Court as the High Court, and the consultation paper noted the danger of criminal trials becoming show trials if they were to be televised. Subsequent to the consultation, televising the courts was made lawful by Section 32 of the Crime and Courts Act of 2013. This provision gives the Lord Chancellor the power, with the concurrence of the Lord Chief Justice, to make an order disapplying Section 41 of the 1925 Act. We are proceeding, as you can see at once, we are proceeding cautiously. Plans are well underway to introduce a pilot scheme in the Court of Appeal uh, and this is going to start uh, later this month. In fact, I'm going to be hearing, I think, the first such case uh, a, week on, a week on Monday. It is a case about the closure of Lewisham uh, Hospital, um, a, a decision which has attracted a great deal of controversy and uh, hostility. But the case in, will turn on, as far as I can see, I've only glanced at the papers, I think it's going to turn on um, uh, an analysis of some extremely badly drafted and complex uh, legislation. I can't for the moment, for the life of me, think that, that uh, people are going to be uh, interested in hearing detailed and elaborate arguments about that. They will be interested in the result. Um, but there it is. We shall, we shall have to see how that all pans out. The consequences of this reform are, are to, uh, of course, remain to be seen. The government in its consultation took the view that opening up the courts to television cameras so that the public can understand how courts work and how in particular the sentence process, sentencing process works was, quote, critical to confidence in the system and to its effectiveness in ensuring that justice was done. Greater accessibility should help to blow away the mystery that surrounds the process. 
public ignorance as to what goes on in courts is not surprising in view of the fact that so few individuals have the time or inclination to visit a court during the working day. And the reform, it seems to me, will certainly help to promote open justice. There are those who fear that televising court proceedings will undermine the due administration of justice and that it will encourage the very kind of prurience that saw Parliament ban photography uh, all those years ago. In these days, when anyone can see almost anything on the website, it seems to me that it is absurd to worry about prurience. But I think we do need to make sure that televising court proceedings doesn't harm justice itself. I can see no objection to filming appeals at any level of our system. I, I, I can't see any basis for limiting television to appeals to the Supreme Court. The experience of that court has shown that the televising of appeals has been an unqualified success. Different considerations arise in those few appeals in the lower courts where evidence is given during the course of the appeal. The general consensus in England and Wales, so far as one can tell, is that the camera should be excluded from trials at which witnesses give evidence and from all jury trials. Some may say that this is rather, pu rather pusillanimous. My personal view is that as a general rule, we should not exclude the camera even from witness trials, but that the judge should have the power to direct that certain cases are not televised if he considers this to be necessary in the interests of justice. For example, it's difficult to conceive circumstances in which it will be in the interest of justice to televise proceedings involving children. But I emphasize that that is my personal view, uh, and I think it is wise that we are proceeding on a step-by-step -step basis, and that each step of the way is the subject of a pilot study, and then reflection and consideration. There are many who do not share um, my view. Uh, I know there is a range of practices in different countries, and we need to learn from and examine and learn from their experiences. I have to say that lawyers and judges uh, do tend to be rather conservative creatures. Uh, and some of them complain that they're rather punch drunk uh, with having to adapt to all these changes to our system that are being piled upon us year by year. Um, and I have heard co concerns expressed in recent discussions in the last few weeks from colleagues uh, about um, having cameras in court, uh, their concern about whether the angle of the television camera will be such uh, that um, the public will be able to see what documents they have on their desk. Uh, there is a, a, a real concern uh, in uh, criminal appeals where the majority of the judgments are given uh, extempore because if it were done in any other way, uh, life would be utterly impossible. Uh, and one simply wouldn't get through the business in anything like the time that, that we do. So in most, most cases are relatively straightforward, and in most cases, the judge uh, who is going to give the, the judgment of the court has worked out in advance the bulk of what he's going to say and has probably written a lot of it out. But to my mind, there's nothing wrong with any of that. Uh, and it is, anyone, it is obvious to anyone who sits in court and hears a judgment given in those cases that that is precisely what has happened. But for some reason, some of my colleagues think that, that if, if uh, uh, what goes on in court is shown to a wider audience, uh, that that's going to make all the difference. And I've been told that this will mean that um, judges will have to give more reserved judgments and it'll slow the whole process down. Uh, and uh, they will have to pretend to be giving judgments in a fresh and spontaneous way when in reality they're just reading out something that they've already prepared. Um, uh, I, I'm afraid I, I don't really go with any of that. I think we should be uh, open and honest with the public. Uh, and uh, if we do things in the way we do them, if, if we think that the way we do things is justifiable, and I, d I think those things that I've just described are, then I don't think we should be defensive and shy about the public seeing what we are doing. Anyway, this is a topic that's going to be the subject of quite a lot of further discussion in, in the coming weeks and months. It seems to me obvious that the, these reforms provide an important means of bringing court proceedings to a far wider public audience than before. It, it is true that the reforms uh, may carry certain risks and we should be cautious in how we proceed. But legal proceedings have evolved over time in response to changes in society and they will undoubtedly continue to do so. 
we live in an age of television and technology. Opening up the, the courts to the cameras is a necessary reform of this age. It is one that we must make work in the public interest. Television has been with us for a long time. I need now to turn to some of the other technological changes which are relevant to my theme. So I'll start with social media. Not so long ago, if court reporters wanted to report what was going on in particular proceedings or to report the outcome of a trial or of a judgment, they had to wait in court. And then when they had the information they needed, they would make a dash for the public phones when within the court building. With the advent uh, of the mobile phone, there was no need to make that dash. The reporter could just walk out of the courtroom and make a call uh, to the news desk. The dash to the public phone now seems to be a rather quaint piece of history. And even the use of the mobile, I believe, is receding into the past. This is because of the arrival of smartphones and social media. And as I'm sure you all know, it is now possible to report in 140 characters or less and to give a running commentary of whatever you want in real time through Twitter. Equally, it is possible through the use of a mobile email to file a report with the news desk from within the courtroom itself or to put a report onto a live blog. I, ha I have to say, I, I wonder what um, my forebears would have made of all of that. Uh, uh, judges of even just 20 years ago cannot believe that judges of today tolerate what is currently going on. Uh, and that's not just uh, a comment about the, as they would see it, the uh, are having to accept gross falling in standards of the provision that's made available to judges when they go to lodgings on circuit. But the provision for court reporting by means of the internet and the use of smartphones was frustrated by the prohibition on the use of mobile phones within the court. The ban was explained in the Lord Chief Justice's consultation in 2001 on the use of mobile technology in courts because of the potential they have, and I quote, to interfere with the proceedings and the fact they may be used with ease to make illegal sound or video recordings or to take photographs. In addition, the blanket prohibition against the use of mobile telephones in court is also easier for court staff and security officers to enforce than, the, than if there were some permitted uses and some prohibited uses. The blanket ban meant that whatever benefits might arise through, uh, through uh, the use of smartphones and the internet could not be re realized. The Lord Chief Justice uh, in issued some interim guidance to the courts that provided an interim framework for the use by the media of mobile phones in court so that live text-based reporting could be carried out in court. This was followed uh, by a formal consultation on whether and if so how much reporting should be permitted. And in December 2011, formal practice guidance was issued. It covered the use of mobile email social media and internet enabled laptops in and from courts in England and Wales to provide live text-based communications. It emphasized that the court has the overriding responsibility to ensure that proceedings are conducted consistently with the proper administration of justice and that open justice is a fundamental aspect of that. It noted, however, that there are, are exceptions to open justice that photographer from court and make, making sound recordings of proceedings was prohibited. And then it went on to say that the normal, indeed almost invariable rule, uh, has been that mobile phones must be turned off in court. There is no statutory prohibition, however, on the use of live text-based communications in open court. And it, it went on to uh, make some fairly detailed provisions as to the circumstances in which um, uh, those um, forms of communication would be permitted. The guidance noted that the issue of improper interference with the administration of justice was likely to be most acute in relation to criminal proceedings. Witnesses outside court would be able to read evidence given in court via Twitter or live blogs. Inadmissible evidence posted on Twitter might influence the jury. Live reporting in any proceedings might serve to create pressure on witnesses or litigants more generally, distracting them or worrying them so as to weaken the quality of their evidence. It is perhaps not surprising that following the publication of the guidance, there were some teething problems. For example, the criminal trial for tax evasion of Harry Reb Redknapp, a famous football manager, was interrupted because a journalist had tweeted the name of a juror 
and some of the evidence given by a witness in the absence of the jury. A fresh jury had to be sworn in, and the matter was referred to the attorney, attorney, attorney general, and tweeting was, was banned for the rest of the proceedings. But since then, so far as I'm aware, court-based tweeting and blogging has taken place without any significant hitches. The recent High Court action concerning David Miranda uh, was, for instance, live tweeted by the Guardian newspaper with apparently no difficulty. It seems to me that, that um, insofar as that there is a problem, uh, it, it really is confined to criminal cases, and the problem for us is largely uh, based on the fact that we have juries. So, mu so many of the, the difficulties that we have and the complexities of our criminal procedure um, derive from the fact that we have juries. Life would be far, far simpler if we had criminal trials without jurors, but uh, there is no, absolutely no, no appetite for or enthusiasm for making that change in our country at the moment. It is difficult for the judiciary to know to what extent live tweeting and blogging from the court is finding an audience. No doubt the means exist to discover how many people follow such tweets and blogs, but I'm not aware of any research yet which has collated such data as exists. It would, I think, be useful if someone were to undertake the research. In the absence of such evidence, and on the assumption that there is an audience for such court reporting, whether through journalistic tweets tied to a newspaper or television channel or by members of the, the public or legal bloggers, I think it can be said that the use of technology is enabling important advances to be made in opening up the courts to the public. As long as, as, long as technology can continue to be used in a way that does not impede the proper administration of justice, its use should continue to be permitted. I now want to say just a few words about the Judicial Communications Office, the JCO, and the Judicial Media Panel. The traditional attitude of the judici judiciary to the media was one of deep suspicion, to put it no higher. Generally speaking, reporters, I'm afraid, were not trusted. I don't say for one moment that I subscribe to that view. The judges behaved like Trappist monks. They spoke through their judgments and only occasionally through their lectures. The media knew that this was the convention. Therefore, if they wanted to, uh, a judicial view on, it, on an issue, they tended to seek out retired judges. There were one or two of these. I must be careful here. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I have one in mind. I certainly won't name him. Uh, but I, uh, I was going to say that usually the people who had had fairly undistinguished judicial careers, uh, certainly the one I have in mind, I think, rather unkindly, possibly fell into that category. He was English. <laughs> <laughs> they enjoyed the publicity which they had not previously enjoyed. That was obvious when I only had to listen to them on the Today program in the morning. The silence of the serving judge was imposed on them by the Kilmuir rules. From 1955, when these rules were first uh, promulgated, until 1987, when Lord Mackay got rid of them, they effectively barred public comment by members of the judiciary. In this, there was no conflict with the principle of open justice. The intention behind the prohibition was to help secure public confidence in the judiciary by preventing them from being drawn into political and other controversy. The relaxation of the Kilmuir rules uh, did not lead to a rush of judges jostling to give interviews with the press, nor did it leave to lead to pressure from the media for comment from the serving judiciary. Where such comment was called for in respect to the judiciary or judicial decisions, uh, the Lord Chancellor would make it uh, under his historic duty to defend the independence of the judiciary. Occasionally, the Lord Chief Justice would speak but his public utterances were comparatively rare uh, and not always an unqualified success. I, I, I should say that currently the convention appears to be that the Lord Chief Justice gives a press conference once a year, and I believe that that works well, uh, but um, others here who've attended those, and I have to confess I haven't, uh, may, uh, will be better equipped to say whether that's right from their perspective or not. Um, I do recall Lord Taylor, who was Lord Chief Justice uh, from 1992 to 96, 
and he was tragically cut short by ill health. Um, he, uh, he was the one, I think, who first introduced the press conference, and he wanted to uh, develop a, an open and cozy relationship with the media. Um, um, I know from discussions with him that he was rather disappointed uh, and uh, got rather disenchanted uh, with his experiences, feel, feeling that the way in which things that he'd said were portrayed by some journalists were not to his liking. But he did um, rather adventurously make a, a, an appearance on a television show called Question Time um, alongside politicians. Uh, and uh, the, I think that appearance was generally regarded as having been a bit of a flop because he had to, he, he felt so inhibited in what he, what he could say that in the end he said nothing of any interest to anyone. And that, that's the danger. You may feel that what I'm saying this morning falls into that category. <laughs> Um, because I'm very conscious uh, of the, the, the problem of saying anything uh, uh, too controversial, uh, which is going to um, haunt me when I, I have to decide things either in my judicial capacity or in my capacity as head of civil justice. In 2005, our constitutional arrangements were changed by the Constitutional Reform Act. The effect of this legislation was that the Lord Chancellor lost his role of being a member of the uh, of the executive and legis legislative as well as head of judiciary, he lost the, that last um, arm of his um, uh, tripartite role, and the Lord Chief Justice became the head of the judiciary of England and Wales instead. The Act imposed a duty on the Lord Chancellor to uphold the independence of the judiciary, thereby by maintaining his historic duty to defend the judiciary from adverse public or media comment of the kind it is likely to re reduce public confidence in the judicial system. But the wider role of representing the judiciary to the media and the public passed to the Lord Chief Justice. And uh, with it, as the House of Lords Constitution Committee noted, the duty to increase public understanding of the judges and the justice system, as well as to help the judiciary to place construct constructive pressure on the executive over areas where there is disagreement or unease. Informing and educating both the public and the executive about what goes on in the courts is clearly an important aspect of open justice administered in an open society. Increasing an understanding of what is done, and more importantly, why it is done, it is, a, is an essential element of securing public confidence in a, an independent judiciary and thereby the rule of law. To help the Lord Chief Justice carry out this duty effectively, the JCO and the Judicial Media Panel were created. The JCO is the Judiciary's Press Office and carries out the role that the Lord Chancellor's Press Office used to play before the 2005 reforms. It was created with the explicit aim of increasing the public's confidence in judges as part of an overall requirement to enhance public confidence in the justice system. It maintains the judicial website, which contains a wealth of information about the judiciary, its role and function, about judicial independence and accountability. It publishes important judgments as well as summaries of judgments which outline the key factual and legal issues and the reasons for the decision, something the JCO shares with the UK Supreme Court. I have to say, I, I think what the Supreme Court does is exemplary and splendid. Um, th they um, publish uh, case summaries of every judgment that they uh, uh, issue. Um, I don't think the Court of Appeal does enough of that, and, and I think we're going to have to do a lot more. But of course, uh, they, the Supreme Court hears far fewer cases than the Court of Appeal, and all uh, of its cases are, or so are, should be, cases of general public importance. Court of Appeal, uh, although a lot of the cases fall into that category, some don't. Uh, but I do think we are going to have to do more to um, uh, produce summaries uh, to help the public understand what we do because a lot of the judgments and I hear complaints from um, journalists about this and indeed others uh, do complain that the judgments of the court are far too long uh, and therefore uh, inaccessible. The JCO also publishes judicial lectures and speeches, judicial responses to government consultation papers as well as reports, practice directions and guidance. 
It doesn't merely ensure that the judiciary has a web presence, as important as that is. It also ensures that wherever possible, a member of its press team is available to talk to the press on issues of interest that arise, in particular contentious issues that arise from judgments. Um, I, I don't know whether uh, they are thought by the, uh, the media to do that job well. There'll be here people, I no doubt, who have strong views uh, uh, on that question. I'd be interested to hear what they, what they say. The office cannot, however, explain or interpret judgments or a judge's sentencing remarks. What the judge says in his or her judgment or sentencing remarks has to speak for itself. But the office can help to place the judgment or the sentencing remarks in their proper context, for example, by ensuring that the press is aware of the full picture. If an inquiry relates to the length of a sentence handed down for a certain criminal offense, it can, for instance, ensure that the inquirer is aware of the relevant sentencing guidelines. What first at, most, first, at first sight might appear to be a very lenient sentence uh, may, uh, it, when placed into, in its proper context, take on a different complexion. The aim of the office is to ensure that the sentence or the judgment is reported fairly and accurately. In this way, if the sentence or judgment still appears to be unsatisfactory, once the context has been fully explained and understood, uh, then uh, criticism of, of the decision uh, can fairly be made. Uh, and if the issue is then regarded as one for political debate concerning whether the law itself should be changed, uh, then uh, that can be uh, the subject for the discussion rather than criticism of the judge. One interesting issue that was raised by Joshua Rosenberg, who's a very respected legal journalist, shortly after the JCO was, in, was established, was whether it should act as the public spokesman for the judges. He meant, should it employ a trained lawyer, or perhaps, as others suggested, a panel of senior or retired judges who could comment on judgment so as to, quote, correct inaccuracies, highlight significant sections in judgments or sentencing remarks, and possibly even explain complex points of law to facilitate more informed media coverage. Uh, I think the idea that a senior judge could play such a role uh, is simply a non-starter. Uh, never mind the fact that that judge would not be able to sit on an appeal. Far more important, it would, I think, risk undermining ju judicial comity and judicial independence. It's one thing for a judge's decision to be overturned on appeal. The risk of that happening is an incident of judicial life, which every, risk, every judge accepts. Uh, and uh, of course, I was immune from that when I was in the Supreme Court. And I have perhaps uh, foolishly um, placed myself in that uh, uh, subject to that hazard um, again. The risk of that happening, uh, they, I, but I would say, I would, I would regard as unacceptable the risk of being exposed to adverse criticism by another judge uh, without the benefit of adversarial argument in a, in a non-judicial context. There is something perhaps to be said for a legally trained person or back to retired judge, our friend the retired judge, explaining complex points of law or the background to sentencing remarks so as to facilitate accurate reporting. This is an idea that we might perhaps consider, uh, although given the existence of the judge's media panel, it is perhaps un an unnecessary development uh, and one that carries with it too great a danger of the spokesman drifting into the realm of defending judgments or explaining that when the judge said X, he or she really meant Y. So let me briefly turn to the media panel. This too was created following the reforms in 2005 it is the responsibility of the Judges' Council's Communications Subcommittee. It was set up as a means by which the judiciary could clear up media confusion, which can simply and easily be rectified, and thereby improve public understanding and confidence in the system. It doesn't exist to enter into a debate with the media or to respond to adverse comment by the media. Uh, how does it work? A small group of judges of wide experience is given media training, uh, that, that in itself is a fascinating experience, um, and I've undergone that. If the media seek judicial comment on a particular subject, they can approach the, ju the, the JCO. Uh, it checks with the Lord Chief Justice and the relevant head of division uh, whether a comment would be appropriate. If it would be appropriate, the JCO arranges for a panel judge, uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, the, the panel judge for the relevant experience to speak to the media. The panel judges do not comment on individual cases, 
They deal with issues that are raised by cases, uh, but only in a generalized way. At the time when, this evidence, when evidence was given to the select committee about the, the media panel, it was still in its infancy. Few requests for interview had been granted. In fact, only 12 inf interviews had been given. Since then, the panel has not been called upon to speak as often as it, as it might have been expected to. This may reflect the care that has been taken to ensure that the members of the panel are not available to comment on issues which are perceived to be too controversial. And it may be thought by the media uh, that we're being far too pathetic and, and feeble about this. Uh, but at any rate, the creation, I think, of the JCO and the panel shows that since 2005, there has been an acceptance that the voice of the judiciary should not only be heard through their judgments. Like Parliament and the executive, the judicial arm of the state needs to engage with the public and to explain its role. Engagement, which is a form of openness, as a means of furthering public legal education, is essential if public confidence is to be maintained in the justice system. As you can see, we are feeling our way and proceeding with care. I think this is the right thing to do. A careful balance has to be struck. On the one hand, people think that the majesty of the law should be preserved. One aspect of this is that the judges should, to some extent, keep their distance. If judges become too familiar, there is a danger that respect for the law will be undermined. On the other hand, what judges do is of enormous importance to the maintenance of stability and well-being of our society. Judges should act in the public interest. Ultimately, they are public servants. That is why the public has a right to understand what they're doing. I can well imagine that what has been done since 2000, the 2005 Act came into force to inform the public about the work of the judiciary is only a start and that both the JCO and the media panel will develop their respective roles further in the years to come. I want to, I see the time, I think we're already running well past our time, and I'm, I'm sorry, Doreen, that we're a, a rather unruly people to, to manage. Um, I find this with counsel sometimes, I must say. <laughs> So to return, just by way of conclusion, to my theme, uh, I think it, it, it is fitting that I should conclude, conclude by noting something that was said by another of my predecessors in Master of the Rolls, Lord Donaldson. He said, the judges administer justice in the Queen's name on behalf of the whole community. No one is more entitled than a member of the general public to see for himself that justice is done. It is true, as he went on to acknowledge in another case, that there are circumstances which justify limits being placed on public access to the courts, where, for instance, such limits are strictly necessary, and I emphasize strictly necessary, to ensure that justice is done. But apart from these situations, all steps should be taken to secure public scrutiny of the courts. This is essential to maintain public confidence in the justice system, and by that means the rule of law itself. In the past, the public could exercise their right to see justice done only by going to court. They could also read press reports, but necessarily these could only be read hours, if not days, after the event. And a journalist's summary of court proceedings is highly selective, uh, and dare I say it, hardly a satisfactory substitute for witnessing the real thing. Anyway, the days when a journalist sat in court all day have gone. Uh, I, I, I understand that that simply, that simply is a luxury that can no longer be afforded. In the 19th century, we reformed our courts and their procedures to make them fit for an industrial age. A system that had evolved to serve the needs of an agrarian society was no longer regarded as sufficient to deliver justice. We now living in a technological age. We have the means to enhance public access to our courts. If we want justice to be truly public, for the courts to be open, we will have to continue to build upon recent advances and utilize the, that technology as far as we can, as far as is consistent with our commitment to ensuring that justice is done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Lord Dyson. Um, I'd like to open up to a couple of questions, if, um, if that's all right with you. Um, and I'll start with the first one. Um, thank you so much for your insights into why and how uh, the courts um, uh, in the UK and Wales have opened up 
uh, for open to uh, enhance open justice for the public. What advice would you give here in Hong Kong to the local courts, um, Justice Ma, um, as to how we can uh, give rationale and explain what we can do here to open up our courts um, to the public, as considering, of course, the importance of rule of law here in Hong Kong? Well, that really is a difficult question for me to throw at me. Uh, the, 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 the difficulty, of course, is that I don't know, I don't know what, what you have here at the moment. So without having that as a sort of starting point, I find it rather difficult to know uh, what to build on. I, I, I would m make the, this general point that I suppose I would say uh, that, um, that you should, I if you're not doing the, the sort of things we're doing and contemplating, we're not. you should do so. Uh, uh, you should do so for the reasons that I've said. Um, I, I, think, I think it's right to proceed slowly, but I, I have no doubt uh, that uh, we're not going to stop at where we are uh, about to be in a few weeks' time. Uh, I think it, it's right that we should go, go a step at a time just to see whether there are pitfalls that, that you, you don't necessarily foresee in advance. And that must be, there are, I mean, we have a government that tends not to like piloting. They seem to think they can work it all uh, uh, out by just employing clever people, and sometimes not even very clever people, to work it out uh, as a matter of theory. Uh, so I think you, you have to do it practically, one step at a time. But I'm sure that we will go further. And I think that the day will eventually come, probably, when we have television uh, in, in all our court proceedings. And I, I, I think. Um, I'm not sure all my colleagues would agree with this, but I, I, I do think that the, the, the press, uh, and they're certainly not stupid, and I think they, are, uh, they will be responsible because they will know that if they, they abuse this, uh, then we'll stop doing it. And so I think that's the, that's the safety net. Um, I, I'm not sure, John, whether you can comment on what I'm about to say. Uh, I, I, I suspect you can't. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it you want to ask the question, nevertheless. But, but, it, but no, no. But it just seems to me that what one ought to explain uh, is that at the moment there are very serious threats to the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary caused by the politicians in our country. I have never known a time in which a prime minister, uh, a home secretary, and a justice minister openly attack your judgments. Uh, as well as those of the Strasbourg Court. Uh, and I haven't known a time in which legal aid is being cut back so much that the right of access to justice is now in jeopardy. Uh, I wonder whether, uh, and the Human Rights Act, of course, is now threatened with extinction if the major governing party wins the next election outright. I don't know whether you can comment on any of that, but uh, I hope what I've just said is accurate. I think it is accurate. Um, uh, how far can I comment on that? I, I, I can say that I have, I have real concerns about some of the proposals that are currently being put forward and on which we are being consulted by the government, particularly their proposals to, as they would say, rein in judicial review, but in practice to make judicial review far more difficult. And we have a government which, say, which says that it, it thinks judicial review is terribly important and it says that it thinks it's very important that uh, government should be held to account. Uh, but we, we all know that, that they all hate it when their decisions are uh, overturned by, um, by, the, by the courts. And uh, I, 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 uh, so I think we, we, have, we, are, we are living in difficult times. The judiciary are going to respond uh, to these consultations. I, the, the responses of the judiciary will be made public. We're in the process of drafting things, uh, but I think I can say, perhaps I can just leave it like this, to say that we are certainly not saying, uh, giving a tick to all these proposals. Uh, as to uh, human rights, um, I, I have publicly stated in a lecture, and I'm going to give another lecture early next year, um, that uh, I am personally uh, a, a great supporter of the Human Rights Act uh, and I, I think it works very well and I think it's most unfortunate that um, what happens is that the, the government and, and, and some, of the, some of the media uh, don't like 
some of the judgments of the Strasbourg Court. Uh, very few. Uh, uh, one can criticize, criticize some of the judgments of that court, just as you can criticize the judgments of, of our courts, uh, and that's right and proper. In fact, the, the, the case of the, um, the Strasbourg case about, about the Estonians was mentioned yesterday. Uh, I, haven't read the, I haven't read the decision. It looked like a very bad decision. There will, of course, be some decisions of that court which uh, we don't like, but to suggest that that's a reason for to, to um, unwind the whole thing um, it seems to me um, uh, totally unwarranted. Um, as to um, criticisms by uh, ministers of judgments, um, it, it's a question of the tone. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the ministers are perfectly entitled to say um, what they do say when they say when they lose a case to say that they are disappointed. The word disappointed I is sort of code for we think it, this is a really bad decision and we're going to try to do something about it. Then of course they have the power to do something about it. They can legislate. Uh, and uh, I, th I think that, um, uh, well I know that, uh, that, that, and that there have been attempts to persuade ministers to tone down their criticisms and they have been successful to some extent um, because um, there was a decision that I gave uh, in about April, I think it was, in the famous case of Al uh, Abu Qatada, the question of whether he should be uh, deported to Jordan to face trial there. Um, and uh, we said, uh, we upheld the decision below that, that uh, a deportation would be uh, contrary to Article 6 and therefore would be unlawful. And I knew perfectly well that this would be uh, greeted w w uh, with great disappointment um, uh, and would be deeply unpopular. Uh, and in fact, I took the trouble in that case to write a case, uh, a summary of the decision myself to explain it in, in and um, it was very interesting that um, the, uh, Theresa May, who, who's no great friend of the judiciary, uh, did not rubbish my judgment. She complained about Strasbourg. She laid the blame for this at the door of Strasbourg. And, and indeed, if there was blame to be laid anywhere, maybe there wasn't, but if there was, it was at Strasbourg. So, um, I, and I think that may have been an example of, a, of a, an understanding that they've really got to tone these criticisms down. So I, th I, thought I have answered your question up to a point, perhaps more than I should have done. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Lord Dyson, I wish you were a justice in the Philippine Supreme Court. <laughs> um, but my question really has to do with the live case. No? The court has only decided on one specific case on um, coverage, TV coverage, and they have done so in a manner that has made it impossible for the media to cover the trial of the Maguindano massacre because they want it to be from beginning to end. And no media can actually afford to um, give that much airspace to one single trial. Now, the concern is always in criminal proceedings, the possibility of trial by publicity, and the fact that it may influence the judge. Can you give us a quotable quote? I mean, declaring ahead of time that I'm going to quote you in the pleadings for the Philippine Supreme Court. <laughs> Well, I think oh, oh, I, I will comment on the first part of what you said because I, th <laughs> because I think that actually raises a rather important point. In the, in the Supreme Court, I think I'm right about this, but there are others here who know better than I. I ought to know this. I think that the, the um, uh, Sky Television covers the actual proceedings and they don't, do not have the right, I believe, to edit bits of the proceedings. Uh, but they also, of course, cover the hand down of the judgment and the, and the, the giving of the reasons, which usually takes four or five minutes. Um, what the, the, the pilot scheme that we're going to have is, is, is a different model. Uh, it will not involve uh, covering the entire proceeding. Well, I think they may be allowed to do that, but they're also allowed to edit and produce edited highlights. And there is a concern, um, there is a concern that the, the journalists will, the television editors will just pick out sort of eye-catching little bits, the odd phrase and exchange here or there, and, and thereby distort the effect of the process. Now, uh, I think that a code has been agreed between the judiciary and uh, the, and the uh, television broadcasters, uh, the object of which is to, um, to ensure that that does not happen. 
And again, we're back to the point that I made a few moments ago. I mean, if, if we find that that code is not being honored, then the broadcasters will know that the, the, the ultimate sanction is that we will just stop it. So I, I'm hopeful that they will not do it, but occasionally they might be tempted. Um, so th that's, that's the slight concern that, that one has about the editing process, because we, we will have no control over the editing process. So I, I hope that uh, it deals with part of your point. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question on another topic that I think is linked to your theme, and you may be able to comment on, which are non-publication orders or suppression orders, we call them in Australia. Is the approach of the courts changing to non-publication orders with the changes in technology? I, I'm not aware that it is, but I, um, I, I, I really can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Um, Lord Dyson, uh, we have a situation in Hong Kong um, that for the court, uh, uh, information from the court, uh, such as calendar, we cannot aggregate, archive, or publish it on our own on some platform, including online. Um, because under our Data Protection Act, um, the information published by the court is for one purpose, and we're not supposed to repurpose it. Right. And we, we find it very odd. So do you have that situation? How does it contradict? Does it contradict with the private data protection issues in the UK? I, I think it probably does, but I don't. I don't know the. I am sorry. I, again, I have to put up my hands and say I don't know. But why would you? This you talk about the calendar. Uh, why? Why would you want to? I mean, you can always access their website for the calendar. You mean the the, the, the calendar of the hearings and the, the, the dates of the cases? Is that what you mean? Well, for a number of reasons, it's not easily accessible by the public. Um, uh, it's not searchable, it's not easily available, oh. and so third-party service like, can help to make the I information see. more accessible uh, to the public. Yeah. Actually, it applies to other issues of information in Hong Kong. And actually, Charles is here, our legislator here. We have a major uh, situation, uh, uh, case where the, um, public information, we consider public information uh, or judgments that, w but we're not allowed to aggregate and to be presented on easily accessible uh, a public platform. Well, I, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say about that. I, I think I'm going to, to leave you to fight your battles over that one. <laughs> Ah, that's better. <laughs> the idea of being able to text or tweet uh, from court, to file from court, very appealing. Uh, in Hong Kong, we can't do that. Uh, the official line from the judiciary is that it will somehow interfere with the recording equipment in court. Uh, I suspect the real reason is that they're, they're worried about disruptions in court, matters being reported which should not be reported. Um, it sounds uh, as if um, uh, in England, um, uh, after the Harry Redknapp uh, problem, uh, things have settled down. I just wonder, in your experience, uh, maybe feedback that you get from other judges, um, has this worked well? Have there been any problems? Is the quality of the reporting uh, in, the, in this manner good quality court reporting? Well, I've no idea about the quality of the reporting. I, there's no way I would know about that, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm simply not aware of there having been any problems. Uh, I, do, I do get the slight sense that I'm being used as a bit of a battering ram to try and batter down s s some of the fortresses that, that in different jurisdictions you're, you're encountering. Uh, uh, 
uh, Lord Dyson, uh, I just want to start by saying I really enjoyed your, your talk. It's wonderful to hear a judge quote from Bentham uh, as one who often quotes Bentham when I'm making submissions on openness in Canada, um, where we've had uh, televised Supreme Court hearings for, I think, a quarter of a century. Um, and the battles tend to now be more both with what Andrew talks about, which are the publication ban issues, but also uh, the issue of access to court documents and court exhibits. And I'm wondering what's now happening in the United Kingdom with respect to that. We have issues where we know there's a sensational trial, there's particular documents which are being filed, and uh, the journalists have difficulty accessing them in some cases, even though there's a clear constitutional right uh, to access. So uh, what's happening in the United Kingdom on that front? Well, I think it, I, I, there are journalists here uh, from the UK. I mean, I don't know whether um, perhaps uh, Eileen uh, could say something about that, because I, I um, it's the journalists who will be able to tell you. Um, I, are, they, again, are they, is the court, are the judges, uh, the administration of the justice becoming more receptive to working out protocols so that the journalists not only are yeah. able to tweet instantly what's happening in the courtroom, but they're able to get uh, a copies hand, of videotapes, a, a hand pictures, a hand is going like up that. there and we'll, we'll be better able to give the answer than I, than I am. Paul, just to, just to say, um, in the UK now on criminal cases, we've just had issued some guidance from the courts, the judges, on accessing documents. And that we have also just updated the criminal procedure rules on criminal cases. So there is now a protocol about what documents should be, the default position should be that they're available. There are certain protections uh, along the lines of data issues, privacy issues, where that default position may be reversed. But generally speaking, the position now is if a document is referred to, even if only obliquely, then you should be able to get hold of the whole document, including witness statements, submissions, and those sorts of those sorts of things. I don't think it's made its way in the same way into the civil procedure rules at the moment, but actually the civil courts have generally been better um, at, at making those things accessible anyway. Thank you very much. Yeah. So far as civil is concerned, many years ago when Harriet Harman uh, was uh, simply a, a civil rights lawyer, um, she was done for contempt of court because her counsel, she passed, she passed to the Guardian, she passed to your newspaper, uh, documents that had been disclosed uh, to her as a solicitor in confidence. Uh, and all the documents were read out in open court. Uh, and as a result of their being read out in open court, she was done for contempt of court. And it went all the way to the House of Lords, where Lord Diplock, in a particularly strange judgment, began, this case has nothing to do with free speech. Uh, I, I then came into it in Strasbourg, and the Strasbourg Commission said, uh, you can't have a rule like that. As a result of which, the rules of the Supreme Court have now been completely changed, so that there is a presumption of disclosure um, unless there is some good reason to the contrary. So on the civil side, I mean, I'm not up to date with the most recent changes to the rules, but those rules have been brought in a long time ago in order to respect free speech. I, I think I can say this, that, that um, I think, uh, I hope it's clear from what I've been saying that uh, um, although we've been proceeding slowly, the, the, the general philosophy, the general climate is, is one of, trying to be open. I personally feel very, very strongly about that and, um, and want to do everything possible to, to assist and to assist the media. Um, there has to be, uh, clearly, there's got to be trust and um, as I said, uh, I operate on the basis that maybe I'm naive, but that, that the media will behave responsibly about this because if they don't, then they know uh, that ultimately um, we will stop um, cooperating and so um, th that's my approach. Right, yeah. Um, good morning. My name is George. I actually, you kind of answered my question already, but since I've been asked to do it, I'll do it anyway. Um, looking at change, um, basically, I'm going to ask a very non legal question. Um, in terms of 
what exactly is the level of fear amongst judges on being put on trial by the media? Well, only then, I mean, if you eradicate that fear, then I think it's quite easy to have this, uh, everything being open. What is the level of fear? <laughs> I, um, do, do they have a fear of being put on trial by the media? I, I can't. I, mean, I expect some do and some don't. Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, obviously judges, judges, we're all ultimately, surprisingly, um, believe it or not, we are human beings. So we, we, we prefer to be loved and praised rather than be <laughs> reviled and criticized. Um, but we accept that um, part of the game is that um, we are going to be criticized and uh, uh, particularly the sort of cases that we do and the sort of cases I do where there's often so much to be said on both sides. Um, you know, people are going to disagree with what you decide and they may disagree in very strong terms and that you accept as being part of a democratic society and part of life. Um, I, I mean, I don't fear that. Um, and I think most judges understand all of that. I don't know if that helps at all, but I, I think you've asked a fairly deep question, and perhaps it's, uh, when we're already overrunning so much, perhaps it's, I'll leave it at that. Perhaps you can talk later with uh, Lord Dyson. Lord Dyson, thank you so much for indulging us. <laughs>